Hello, my name is John Gibbons, and I'm with the product success team here at ServiceNow. Uh, today, I'd like to talk to you about some of the core vulnerability response system properties that are used. So let's dive into this here. Uh, so we have a safe harbor notice. Uh, we're not going to be talking about anything that's, that hasn't been publicly released, uh, so we should be fine. Uh, some of the topics I'd like to go through, um, right, are, are system properties that are used for vulnerability response, uh, vulnerability response common, or uh, security support common. And then we'll do a brief demo and kind of go through some of those properties. So uh, some of the core vulnerability response properties. Now this isn't all of them. There's there's a lot more than than what I have on the screen, but these are these are usually the ones that people are going to modify based upon whatever business process they have or whatever business process uh, they're trying to configure for their customer. Uh, so the first thing here, right? We've got um, this is for application vulnerable item, right? And so this is the exception approver for a level one or a level two, right? Or a positive, false positive approver. Um, so we're going to have the same thing for just a vulnerable item, right? And so these are going to store the sys IDs of whatever uh, assignment group that you want to use to provide those approvals for these exceptions, right? Or false positives. Right, so we also have the false positive one for vulnerable, for vulnerable items. Um, we've also got, um, so this exception rule, uh, so this is, this is, is there an approval required for when you're going to take an exception rule into a terminal state, right? So when you're going to deactivate it, do we need to have some kind of an approval for that? Um, also, right, so is there a, a approval required um, for moving, right, a vulnerable item or a vulnerability group into a terminal state, right? So uh, that would be if you manually move it into that state, do we need to have some kind of an approval process? Typically, the answer is no, but it does depend on, on the business requirements for that. Um, the next one here, right, if, if you want to require, um, right, the approval flow to, to run when you're going to unassign uh, a, a vulnerable item record, um, right, you can kind of enable or disable that flow for, for that. Uh, so that would be like if it came into the wrong assignment group and somebody wanted to assign it and kick it back to the uh, vulnerability response team so that they could take a look at the assignment rules and see if, if something needs to be adjusted or revised. Uh, the next set of properties here, right, we're going to be talking about um, the auto create bull centric, right? So this just says, um, so we're going to automatically create a remediation task um, when that vulnerable item is created for a vol entry that does not yet have a, a, a group already assigned to that. Uh, so this is, I mean, this is on um, out of the box. So uh, the rerun task rules. Uh, so this is just, you know, if the condition changes for that vulnerable item that's associated to that remediation task, if the condition doesn't match anymore, are we going to unlink that vulnerable item from that remediation task and then rerun it back through the remediation task rules? Um, this next one here, right, auto defer VIT in an active accept, exception window, right? So uh, during the ingestion, uh, are we going to automatically defer new VITs that come into the system um, if they still fall under uh, an, a valid exception window? Uh, the closed VIT with excluded detections. Uh, so this is for the new exclusion rules that, that were introduced uh, just recently. Um, Typically, this is you. You wouldn't want to enable this. The only thing I think you would want to enable this for is if you wanted to kind of go, like if you were midstream and you just added an exclusion rule. Uh, do you want it to go out and close all the all the vits that were where those detections match that exclusion rule? Uh, typically, if you start off from the beginning, uh, right, you wouldn't need to enable this. So. Also, uh, th the next one here is just the default assignment group, right? Is there a default assignment group that you want to use uh, during that unassigned flow, right? So if somebody assigns it, do we want to kick it back to a specific group? Uh, last couple here for vulnerability response, right? We've got a default notification group for that unassigned uh, flow. Uh, we've got um, excluded template categories. So if there's uh, when using change management with vulnerability response, if there's certain standard changes that you don't want to be included in the drop down list uh, for users to select, right, you can exclude uh, specific ones, right? 
Um, the next one here is the max inline limit, um, right? The maximum number of VIs and, and CIs to transfer during a split group or create change, right? Or update the, the VG state. Um, this one I, I probably wouldn't modify too much because it could, right? It could affect performance if, if you increase that number quite a bit. And uh, another one here, we've got uh, use product model. Uh, so it just gives you the capability to um, switch to CSDM 4.0 uh, if, if that is being used in that organization, uh, right, to, to switch to those product models uh, when doing any kind of a lookup. All right, next here, uh, we've got um, service classifications. So this one, um, is, is important, especially when the customer has a large amount of, of um, you know, business applications, services, um, technical services, and there's a lot of relationships to all of these things. Um, you know, you, you kind of have to know your data, uh, how you want to do this, but out of the box, it's going to search through business services, technical services, and application services for anything that relates to that associated CI. So if the customer is only using one or they're or using two, right, you would want to go ahead and adjust this property to only use whatever's being used in that environment. Um, otherwise, right, it could, if, if, if there's a lot of relationships being used, this could be become a performance hit just based on the volume. So you kind of have to go through uh, the data and see if this is applicable to change. All right, so this next one here is to show the last open detection. Um, so this is going to um, essentially roll up detections, right? Um, so if, if you have um, three detections that are normally associated to a VIT, this would allow it to just only show one and all that information would roll up to, to one. So, um, right, you would have the last, uh, you know, the last open detection and uh, this scheduled job would run. So typically um, depends again depends on on customer preferences and and, and how they want to run this. Uh, but it is advised to to keep it false um, because once you once you enable that roll up you can't undo it. So um, there's a good there's a good article out there about this. Uh, the next one here, uh, this is just vulnerability response common properties here. So um, this is just the auto close VIs that are linked to a retired CI. So if, if somebody comes in and retires a CI, sets that install status or that operational status to retired, uh, what it's going to do is it's going to go ahead and close uh, all the associated bits. So again, this is highly reliant on, on, the, on the customer's processes. And if they're actually retiring CDIs and using that field, um, so there's there's some other there's another property that we'll talk about that's kind of, that's kind of linked to this and and how everything works. So uh, now we're going to talk about security support common properties here. Um, so we, the I I would say that these are probably the more important ones when you're dealing with CI matching, uh, and and how that's going to work, right? So. You can see here the first one uh, is filter out decommissioned CI. So this has a, a lot to do with the last property uh, that we talked about. Uh, so this is going to, um, if enabled, right, this is not going to include any CIs that have been de decommissioned. So you, if you have a server, uh, that server uh, has has the install status or operational status set to retired. Um, and the, the scanner still finds it, what's going to happen is it's going to create a new CI a new unmatched uh, or in class classified hardware record or incomplete IP record. So um, this is really dependent on the customer's uh, internal process for how they handle retiring CIs. The next one here is the ignore CI class. Uh, so this is used to go ahead and define certain CI classes to be excluded from any kind of matching results. So for example, if, if you have um, if you have a DNS name entry in your CI, your CMDB, and you have a server uh, name in your CMDB, and they both have the same name, uh, the CI matching could potentially pick up that DNS name and return that as the result for your vulnerable item. Uh, so you, you're going to want to go ahead and include any CI classes where you don't want any kind of matching uh, to be applied into this property. 
the next one here, right, is unmatched cloud resource enabled. Uh, so this is just going to determine where these cloud resources are going to be created, right? So um, if, if the property is set to false, right, it's going to create it in the unclassed hardware. Otherwise, it'll create it in the cloud resource. Uh, this is important when we get into to, uh, IRE, right, and how IRE is going to uh, essentially reclassify any of these devices. Uh, the next one here is we have the update on CI change. Uh, so all this is going to do is uh, when you reapply CI lookup rules um, and that uh, those, those rules go out and find a discovered item and it actually finds a different match than what it had before, uh, this is just going to go out and update the, uh, the vulnerable item, right, test result and the discovered item with that CI change. So it's going to go through and kind of sync all of your data. So it's important to, to leave this one enabled. All right, uh, next here we have auto promote. Uh, so the auto promote property is, is very important um, when you're doing any kind of matches um, for CIs that have related parent CIs. Uh, a good example is network adapter, right? So we don't want to do a match against a network adapter for that vulnerable item. We want to use the associated host record. Um, so there's also some other classes uh, that are not included. This is included out of the box, right? So we're going to use these ones to, to link up to. Uh, but for example, if you were trying to match like on, on a VMware network adapter, right? You don't want to match on that. You want to match on the instance associated to that network adapter. So that would have to be a net new entry that you would have to put in here. Uh, this next one here, CI creation through IRE. Uh, so this is enabled by default. And what this does is it's going to allow CIs to be created in the unclassed uh, hardware class, the incomplete IP uh, class, or the unmatched CI class. Uh, if you set this to false, everything will be created in the unmatched CI class, and then IRE is not going to be able to reclassify those. Uh, the next one here is the background job, max concurrency. So um, there's a lot of jobs within the system that uses the background job framework. Um, this just dictates how many concurrent threads that the system can use, right? Uh, out of the box, it's 10. Um, so, right, you want to be a little bit careful. Make sure your instance can handle if you want to increase that. If you want to increase, uh, you right, to a total concurrency of 15 threads, then you could make that change here. Uh, the, the next one here is the, uh, the discovered item reconciliation. So this just tells us how many discovered items uh, can be processed at one time when you're going to do any kind of reapply lookup rules. And then uh, finally, we have the, the max integration payload size. This is just going to uh, give us the ability to adjust the payload size that it's allowed uh, for, for processing within the, the vulnerable item framework. Okay, let's jump into a quick demo here. Uh, so you can see here, right, I'm, I'm at the, uh, the system properties. Uh, I'm looking for, right, if we take this and we group this by the application, right, you can see there's a bunch here, right, there's 67 for vulnerability response. We obviously did not go through all of those, uh, but there's a lot here that um, that don't really need to be adjusted unless you have a specific use case where you would need to adjust that, uh, right? But you can see I've got some for, for uh, integrations, right? So uh, you're definitely going to want to come in here and take a look at um, any kind of uh, properties that you need to adjust, right? Again, if you come in here and we look at um, the security sport common ones, right? You can see here, there's that auto promote. And then, um, right, here's the ignore class. So you can see out of the box, it's, it's using these ones here, right? So if you want to make an adjustment, you'd have to, you'd have to come down here and make your adjustment down here. Same with the ignore class. I would say that these two are probably the most commonly uh, used properties that need to be adjusted and maintained uh, in order to affect your, your CI match rate. OK, 
Okay, so in summary here, uh, we've learned today about some of the core uh, vulnerability response system properties within each of these, uh, these applications, right, for vulnerability response, vulnerability response common, and security support common. Uh, provided you a couple links here, right, obviously the doc site. Uh, system properties is, is not generally uh, just listed in one document. It's it's usually spread within the release notes because right they keep coming out with new properties to control additional functionality. So uh, this is probably your best place to go, or right to go where I showed you in the demo. Uh, just go to that table and you can go through all those properties. A lot of them have descriptions and they tell you exactly what they're used for. So I appreciate your time today and uh, have a good day.